a quick question for you today. Have you ever felt like, or do you feel like, um, oftentimes you're just living in the dark? Anybody? From time to time? Uh, I don't know what that may look like for you, but uh, maybe in your case, you feel a little bit confused about what's coming. Uh, whether you are in college and getting ready to graduate or taking a break over the Christmas holiday and then going back in, the spring, or in January and starting another semester. But what, what does the future hold? After you graduate, what type of job is going to be available to you? Maybe you feel a little bit in the dark. You feel a little bit alone or lonely. And I don't know what that looks like exactly, but maybe for you, you want marriage to work and to be better and, and for things to go well, and it's just not right now. And so you feel a little bit lonely. Maybe even though it's the Christmas season, maybe you're a little bit worried because we talk about the birth of a baby, and maybe in your particular circumstances, you worry that that may not ever happen. Maybe you feel rejected, uh, maybe at work or home or in school or wherever it may be, maybe you feel a little bit left out of some relationships or events that are taking place. Maybe you just feel a little bit in the dark. The dark is not a fun place to be, is it? I mean, none of us probably enjoy being in the dark. And we, what we need in those times is a little bit of light. Well, one of the most Im- encouraging and most important components of the Christmas story is this. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. That's what we hold on to, that we live in a dark world and life happens And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is open the paper or turn on the evening news or click on the link on the internet, the headline news, and you'll read very quickly that our culture can be dysfunctional and dangerous and morally declining and even deviant. That's not to say there aren't good people or good moments or glimmers of hope and glimmers of light, but oftentimes we kind of look around and it just seems like there's more evil than good. And so how are we to live in those moments? A lot of times it seems a little bit like the very beginning of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, it was dark, right? We read, in the beginning, the world was dark, it was formless, and then God spoke. He created the sun and the moon. He brought light and life into the darkness. But soon after that, sin enters the world, and there's this element of darkness again, a new darkness, a darkness that has continually plagued humanity ever since. And that's a little bit like the world when Jesus came into it a little over 2,000 years ago. In this series, we've been talking about uh, living in the in-between. And we're talking about Advent. And again, Advent very simply means coming. Talking about the coming of Jesus, but also anticipating, looking forward to his second coming as well. And we've been looking at the different gospel accounts. The first week we looked at Matthew, and then last week Mark. Today we're looking at the gospel of John. And then Tuesday, as part of our Christmas Eve services, we'll be looking at the Gospel of Luke. Today's going to seem or feel a little bit similar to last week in that there are not many of the traditional Christmas elements when it comes to the Gospel of John, just like last week with Mark. But if you dig a little bit deeper, if you read a little bit more intentional, you'll very quickly see the Christmas story is very much there. One of the most common, most powerful biblical images for who God is and how he interacts with this dark world is that God is light. He shines his light into the darkness. He calls us as followers of Jesus Christ to live in that light as well. The Bible talks a great deal about deeds of darkness that we're to reject. It talks about how Satan has been sent out into the outer darkness. All the while, God sits in a throne covered in light. At Christmas time, we talk a lot about light, don't we? I mean, we sing about light. We say, hey, uh, may your days be merry and bright. We don't say or sing, hey, may your days be merry and dark. It wouldn't make any sense, right? May your days be merry and bright. We drive around town and we look at Christmas lights. How many of you have been around Grand Junction looking at Christmas lights already? Yes. Uh, We light candles in our homes, perhaps more candles this time of year than any other Uh, month of the year. How many of you have extra candles this time of year in your home? 
Yesterday, I was out in the garage working on some projects, and I came into the house. I was out there most of the day. I came into the house several times to get some water or eat lunch and, and check on a few things. And it was like uh, through the course of the day, there were just more and more candles appeared. And by the time I went in to take a shower and go to bed last night, I was like, wow, there's just candles that are lit everywhere. Not everywhere, but it sure seemed like it. Some people love candles. And why is that? Well, it, it, that light dispels darkness. As Christians, we have even more reason to talk about light at Christmas time. So John, in his gospel, he describes what happened at Christmas as he said, light shined into the darkness. And because of it, because of Jesus, it's possible for us as followers of Jesus Christ to live in this dark world and know that darkness will never be able to overcome God's powerful light. 2,000 years ago, when God shined his light into the world to deal with with the darkness. Since then, we are still waiting for him to put an end to the darkness. That will come at the next advent. When Jesus returns, we know that the gospel is the deepest solution for people, don't we? The gospel is the answer that we need. And yet in the, in, in the meantime, we live here in the in-between between today and eternal salvation in heaven. There's some dark places that need a healthy dose of light. And so that's where you come in. That's where I come in. We are, we are representatives of Jesus, and we're to be light to other people. So to live faithfully in the here and now, in the in-between, there's some key truths, some foundational truths that John communicates in the first part of his gospel. If you have your Bible with you, open up to John chapter 1. First point is this. God created the world. God created the world. I know that, that well, duh, yeah, thank you, I, I knew that. But it's still a starting point for us. So I want to make sure that we all understand one of the reasons that God left heaven and came to earth was so that he could embody the law, so that he could fulfill and become a visible representation of God's word. So John, as he's going to open this gospel, he's going to use the word, word, as synonymous with Jesus. So John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, again, talking about Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In other words, darkness is no match for this light. And so John begins his gospel by reminding us that God created the world, and Jesus was right there involved in the process the whole time, right beside him. God is in charge of this universe. He created the world. The way I look at it is this. If you create the universe, if you set the stars and the planets in place, in motion, well, uh, simply put, you get to make the rules of the universe. That's just how it works. So no matter how dark some of the corners of the world may seem, God is still creator. He is sustainer of all. And because of sin, the world is not as he originally made it, but he is still no less powerful to overcome any darkness that may take place. Now, for some of you here today, I understand that Christmas can be a difficult time. I've spoken with several of you over the last few weeks, and you've shared with me how you, you dread the holidays. Because you're going to have to interact with these family members or these, you're going to have to address these fractured relationships or you're going to be alone or you're not going to be invited somewhere or uh, all kinds of reasons or maybe you've lost someone during this time and so it's made it difficult as Christmas comes around. But for, for most of us, the darkest part of our lives is not, it's not a place. It wasn't a cave or the dark recesses of a closet. It's not necessarily a place. The darkest place in our life was more of a season that we went through. Something happened. So you were expecting a Christmas bonus and instead the company downsized and you were a part of that. Or maybe it's the struggles that come with aging or the loss of a loved one or the shattered hopes and dreams of a child who was pursuing a team or a program or, or something and it just didn't happen, or it's the guilt that accompanies temptation that we still struggle with. Whatever it may be, we need the light of Jesus in our lives. He can make the darkness flee. And sin 
is still in the world and it's still in us, but God has the power to do something when we allow him to work through us. God created the world. Here's the second foundational truth that John shares with us. God loves the world. Perhaps the best known scripture in all of the Bible is just a few chapters after John 1. John chapter 3, verse 16, you probably know the verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. So not only is God creator of the world, but he has the power to win over the darkness. He sees people who struggle. He sees people who are in the day-to-day, who are lost and hurting, and love compelled him to shine his light, Jesus, into the world, to make a way that each and every one of us would not have to live in that situation, would, would be freed from the power of sin, would make salvation possible. And when, when that happens, it chips away at the darkness that is here in the world. John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, not of human decision or human's, uh, husband's will, but born of God. So our responsibility is to receive him. It's to accept him. You don't just automatically get the benefits of Jesus coming along unless you receive him. You choose to receive him as your Savior and Lord. You might think of it this way. Let's say after the service today, uh, you're out in the lobby and you're making your way out to your car and outside the doors, I meet you out there and I've got a big gift and it's all wrapped and it's got your name on it. And, and I say, hey, it's, I'm so glad you're here today. I've, I've been thinking about you and I, I made this gift for you. And what you don't know is that I've done some research and found out not only what you want, but what you really need. And I've taken a lot of time and money to put this together and sacrificed a great deal. And I said, hey, this is for you. Oh, wow, thank you. Hey, you can open it right now if you want. You know what, I'm kind of in a hurry right now and, and there's people passing by and you know what, we've got some places to be. Can I open it later? Sure, no big deal, you can open it later. And so you get in your car and off you go. And I see you a couple days from now at our Christmas Eve service. Hey, how did you like it? Oh, the gift. Yeah, how, how did you like, you know what, uh, just, you know how the season is, been busy and, and hectic, and I just, I haven't had a chance to open it yet, but I've got it set aside underneath the tree, and I'll get to it someday, and, and I, thank you so much. It doesn't, you don't know how much it means to me that, that you've given me this gift, and for some reason, we don't see each other again for a few months, and I'm out with my family at a restaurant, and you're there, and as I walk in, and, oh, well, you know, eyes meet, and you come running up, and hey, this is amazing. We were just talking about you, and it must be a God thing. This is, I can't believe that you're here, and we're here, and all. Hey, how did you like the gift? Oh, you know what? I've just been hectic and busy, and I haven't, haven't had a chance to open it yet. Oh, well, no, no big deal. I just, you know, I made that for you, and really put a lot of thought into it, and you know what? I'll, I'll, I really appreciate that. It, I was just telling these people that we were with. You'd never guess it, but Seth, he gave me a gift. <clears throat> I'll open it someday. Someday. And there's going to come a point in time where I, as the gift maker, gift giver, it's going to hit a home that, you know, it's, for some reason or another, um, they didn't accept my gift. I mean, a gift is only a gift if it's received. A gift is only put to use if it's opened, if it's utilized. If it's not opened and put to use for its purpose, then what's the point? And there might be someone here today who... You, you know the Christmas story, and you know all the details, and you could, you could quote much of it from heart, and you recognize, you realize, you understand the significance of why Jesus came. We've never done anything with it. You haven't done what the wise men did when they came face to face with the gift, that they bowed down and worshiped him. Someday, someday, and I sure hope that day is today. I know you're in a hurry, but I sure hope that that day is today. And I don't know if it's apathy or busyness or, or what. Someday, I hope that someday is today. Here's 
Please hear me when I say this. The, the unopened gift of Jesus, the Savior of the world, does you no good if you don't take the time to embrace him with your life. We just read verse 12. I want to read it again. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. If you choose to receive the gift, there are implications, there are promises, there are things that immediately begin to be put in motion. As an heir, there are some significant things for those who wholeheartedly receive the gift. Philippians 4, Paul writes about God giving an offering, a peace that passes all understanding. That as life happens, when things happen, when, when, when stuff hits you and people are, hey, how are you, how are you handling this? How are you seemingly okay? Well, you know what? I can't explain it, but somehow God has given me a peace in the midst of this. That's what God does for his family members. In Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about God will shower us with the gift of grace. He gives us his grace and forgiveness. It's nothing we earned. It's nothing we deserved, but he pours out his grace, his forgiveness on us. In John 3, verse 16, again, we just read it. He promises us eternal life. When you are in the family of God, when you are joined together with the other children of God, there is unity and strength and freedom from sin and darkness. It's the light that dispels the darkness. In John chapter 8, verse 12, uh, Jesus says this, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Then in Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. So which one is it? Is Jesus the light of the world, or are you the light of the world? Are we the light of the world? Well, I think it's both. Jesus is the source of the light, and we are to reflect who he is. When it comes to light, you have two choices. You can either absorb the light, or you can reflect the light. And we all know the types of people that the world just kind of seems to revolve around them, right? Right? I mean, don't name any names, but you know those types of people who, when they are in the spotlight, it is all about them. They relish the moment in the spotlight, and they're going to absorb it every single chance they get. But if you're part of God's family, you realize that the world revolves around Jesus. The light shines on Jesus and through Jesus, and we're called to reflect that light. It's our responsibility. It's our calling to reflect that light to other people. Don't miss this. The light only serves its purpose where there is darkness. If we're called to reflect the light of Christ, the light only serves its purpose where there is darkness. So we're to let our light shine towards others that they can come into the light as well. You know, this week affords you some great opportunities for shining the light for reflecting the light, right? Christmas and Christmas Eve, we've talked about this before, but people tend to embrace Christmas traditions around this time of the year that they otherwise wouldn't be interested or come to church. And it's it's kind of strange, but it's just the way it is. So again, just to make clear, Tuesday afternoon, we have two Christmas Eve services. They're identical, 1.30 and 3 o'clock. For those of you who are working Christmas Eve, I I apologize. Uh, We may have overlooked that a little bit, but We'll be looking at that uh, later on. Andy Stanley preaches in Atlanta. He talks about how this time of year, he encourages, challenges his people to be very mindful of, observant of, listening for the three knots. And he explains it this way. When you hear these knots from someone, then, then clue in that this might be an opportunity to invite them to church. First of all, I'm not in a church. If you're talking with someone, they say, you know what, I'm, I'm not in a church. Chances are, there's a high probability they are inviting opening the door to give you permission to to invite them to church. Second of all, things are not going well. When someone makes that statement, things are not going well, they're hurting. They're giving you a hint by saying, you know what, life is tough right now in our marriage, with our finances, with our kids, whatever it may be, things are not going well. Chances are they're looking for hope. They don't want to be alone. The third nod is this, I'm not prepared for this. When a person is confused, they can't handle something that they're facing, they don't want to face it alone, they want someone there with them, you know what, Um, I'm not prepared for this. It's an opportunity to invite them to church. We have the hope, we have the light that God has to offer. As we live in the in-between of Jesus' first coming and his second coming, we, we want to be prepared and we want to help prepare other people for his return. So don't just celebrate that light 
but realize that that light has been handed off to us to reflect to other people. Some of you need to shine your light in a new and different way to family and friends this time of year. And maybe it's at your family's Christmas celebration. Maybe it's at a staff party over the next few days. And, and in the past, maybe you've lowered your guard a bit. And this year, things are going to be different. Maybe it's an opportunity for you to connect with other people at the party and just talk with them and hear their story and let them know, you know what, I, thanks for sharing. I, I'll be praying about that or whatever it may be because so many people are going through difficulty this time of year. At your family reunion, maybe you take notice of that person who has been isolated from everybody else. Nobody wants to talk with them. You know that crazy uncle, right? And don't name any names. I've done that before and it always comes, people listen and it's like, oh yeah, that guy. Um, if you don't know who that crazy uncle is, might be you, okay? <laughs> but spend time with that person who everyone else has isolated at the family gathering and, and just, just just care for them, love on them. Maybe you can send a care package to a missionary, or maybe you can give an anonymous gift to neighbor or coworker, whatever that may look like. Maybe you gather the Christmas cards that you've received this year, and every night at dinner, you stop and pray for a family until you've made your way through those cards. Find a way not just to celebrate the light of Christmas, but to reflect the light of Christmas of Jesus to other people. Instead of being drawn into the darkness, celebrate it. Here's the third point. God entered the world. God entered the world. God created the world. God loved the world. Finally, God entered the world. That's perhaps the most amazing part of the Christmas story. God left heaven, left a perfect paradise. He, come, he came, he took the form of human beings in the form of his son, all the limitations. He came to our dwelling place. And in verse 14, John is going to go back again. He's going to use the word, word. The word, Jesus, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I want you to think for just a moment the, the, the best place that you've ever been or stayed. And I don't know if that's a fancy hotel or a cruise ship or an island or your rich uncle's condo. I, I don't know. But the fanciest, nicest place with all the amenities that you've ever been. And then just imagine for a moment that, that you've... You've been able to enjoy much of your life there, all of your life in that place. And then one day something happens and all of a sudden you find yourself living under an overpass for the rest of your life. And I, maybe that's a poor illustration. It's just the best I could come up with, okay? So I hope I don't offend anyone. But just imagine for a moment Jesus being in paradise, in heaven, perfection, all is well, and leaving that for a place less than. That's what he did. He put on flesh. He gave up all the amenities of heaven, and he came here to this place. That's love at its highest level. Then he died on a cross. My, my favorite paraphrase of verse 14 comes from the message. The word became flesh and blood, moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. In order to shine his light most brightly, in order to rescue the world he created and loved, God himself put on skin, put on flesh in the form of his son to live with humans. He became approachable and relatable and relevant. The book of Hebrews describes Jesus this way in chapter 4. For we do not have a high priest, talking about Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. That's our Jesus. You know, we have the tendency, however, to sanitize our Savior, don't we? We, we see him in a white robe. He's never spending time with sinners. Instead, he's kind of aloof and oftentimes on a mountainside petting sheep, right? That's what we do. He, he's He's off praying and talking to God. He's never getting dirty. He's never having fun. He's never playing around. He's never spending time with his neighbors, and he certainly isn't spending time with sinners. That's what we tend to do. That's the complete opposite of the gospel accounts. The biggest complaint during Jesus' day was that he spent so much time, all of his time, in fact, with sinners. I don't know if this is appropriate. I'm going to share it. 
some of the most pointed criticism that we, we get is um, about the people that we spend time with uh, or the efforts that we take and make to reach people who are far from God. And the most pointed criticism comes from people who are followers of God. And I, I hope that doesn't sting too much, but I need you to hear that. Why is it that we who are followers of Jesus Christ, who, who are believers, are so critical of efforts and time and resources spent towards reaching other people who are far from God? We're to be a people who, uh, who as we follow Jesus, we're called to reflect God's light into a world. We can do it. We, we can step cautiously and carefully, and we can be very purposeful and prayerful, and we can step into the darkness and shine the light of Jesus. That's what Jesus did. When he passed through the door of heaven, divinity took on the form of humanity. He left the hails of glory for the nails of Calvary. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. That's quite a trip. He came to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt how much he loved you, how much he loves me. I heard a story years ago about a family that lived out in the Midwest. And things had gotten rocky in their marriage. And uh, it got to the point where the wife was really disillusioned with marriage and was exhausted from being a mother and felt like she just needed to get away for a little while. And one morning, the husband woke up and his wife was gone. And in her place was a note that just said that she'd left. And so he decided, well, maybe she just needs some space. And so he gave her space for a little while and didn't pursue her, but he did call her every day. And he left her voicemails, hey, we love you, we need you, please come home. And uh, she didn't ever respond. And as Christmas approached, he actually took drastic measures. Weeks had gone by. And so he hired a private investigator to figure out where she might be. And after some research, they were able to track her down. She was staying in a CD motel just outside of Las Vegas. And so um, not letting her know, he made contact with the husband just to let him know where she was. Well, Christmas Day, she woke up and there was a knock on her hotel room. And it was subtle at first and then became more adamant. And finally, she got up and went and looked out the peephole and realized her husband was standing there. And so she opened the chain and cracked open the door and stepped outside to his embrace. And he said, why, why, haven't, you, why haven't you come home? Why haven't you responded? We love you. We need you. Come home. And she said, you know what? Um, you told me that you love me. You said that you needed me. And then you came. So she jumped in the car with him after packing up her few things and they made their way back home. And as Christmas wrapped up, the season wrapped up, and the tree was back in the attic, and the children were back in school, that, that's what their conversation returned to. You said that you loved me. You said that you needed me, but, but then you came. And here's the takeaway this week. Open your gift and share it with others. God came. He sent his son in the form of a gift over 2,000 years ago. The God of the universe, he came to show you that he loves you. More than just reading about it in his word, more than just hearing about it, the God of the universe came and showed you. He set aside his power and authority to reveal his love and humility. He came as a helpless baby. When he returns again, when Jesus returns again, it will be in power. Have you opened your gift and shared it with others? Would you stand with me today?